What's up everybody? Uh, welcome to this week's video. We had a ton of requests for um, how we set copper and brass rivets, the solid type. Uh, you'll see some examples of what they are throughout the video as well as prior to this. Uh, hopefully you take something away from this, uh, whether you're a maker or you just are interested in how we make some of the things we make. While you or others might do some of this differently. This is by no means a 100% you have to do it this way guide. It's simply what works for us, what we enjoy. Um, we have a lot of pride in our, our crafting and working with our hands. So I like to think that some of the processes that we do are more on the premium side of things. Uh, we invest in our tools. We buy nicer tools. Um, obviously when we first started, we started just like anybody else simple tool startup kit reasonably priced and you think those tools are phenomenal and then you get your hand on some nicer tools and then from there some nicer tools so it's very nice to work with with good quality tools but at the same time a lot of these processes can be performed with just basic tools you can get at uh, your local leather store or craft store or even some of the stuff you could find in a hardware store if you like the video, subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up if this helps you out in any ways. We're gonna continue doing these uh, on different processes that we perform. Hopefully you learned something from it. Maybe we'll learn something from you in the comments. So any feedback, feel free to leave it. All right, jumping right into it. We're gonna cover the rivets. So we use a solid copper and a solid brass rivet. It's a two part. On the left you see the brass, on the right you see the copper. These rivets are extremely durable. Uh, they're made for use and abuse, and they hold up to really anything. The only negative to them is if you need to make a repair, you have to drill out the rivets. So it's a two-part system, and these rivets come in different sizes. We use a number 9 and a number 12 rivet, number 9 being of the large, larger size. Uh, that's on a majority of our projects, with the exception of radio straps. We don't use any of these rivets on our radio straps. The number 12 rivets, the smaller ones we use on bags and wallets and such. So here's the second part of the system, the burr. It's essentially a washer and it slides down over the post of the rivet. So in turn, that creates your connection point. So now that you know about the hardware, now we're going to jump into the tools used to set it. So there's a variety of options here. What you see is essentially the starter tool set here. Um, that is from Weaver Leather. It's a two-in-one. So you're seeing both the anvil and the setter, but two-in-one, you see it's got the hollow end and then the domed end as well. So you do both processes. After you cut the rivet, you would use an anvil as like on the bench or that little splash anvil that's in my hand. That's just something to strike against if you don't have a larger anvil or a railroad tie, railroad track. So that tool's good. The only drawback to it is it leaves some tool marks. Um, it's entry level though, affordable. Anyone can get started. When you're ready to upgrade this set that we use, it's a three piece set by Douglas and you buy it based on the size rivet. So that's for a number nine set there. We absolutely love these tools. It's a three step process. Really great craftsmanship on the design of these as well. The handles are tooled um, and you can see just by a glimpse of the handles what tool you're grabbing. They're numbered essentially. They have bands that wrap around them. So one, two, and three. So whether you stow your tools up on the wall or in a pouch, you can easily identify which one's next or whatever in your process. Very nice set, more expensive but it's definitely a premium item. It makes working copper and brass rivets a lot easier and it gives you a cleaner finish. So what we're gonna be working on today, it's gonna to be a pretty much a build along for one of our turnout belts. Uh, the one you're looking at here is a demo. It was the first one we actually made with some scrap leather and hardware we had. Learned a lot making that we're going forward. So this is the buckle receiver piece for our turnout belt. It's a two part belt, one with the Cobra buckle and the adjustable buckle on the other end. So that way it allows somewhat of a universal fit. We get the whole size, um, the customer size 
and make that as a center hole, but they still have adjustability in either direction, utilizing still that very nice Cobra buckle. So here we're gonna get ready to set our rivets. We take our piece, slid the belt keeper on, and a customer on this one chose brass. So it's a solid brass buckle, as well as a rivet and burr. I like to go ahead and center up my keeper, uh, slide in both rivets on the attachments and get it set. So that way I'm moving efficiently. I'm doing the steps together instead of separate. I also generally would have folded the other side up, placed the Cobra buckle on and done it together. So I wasn't making repetitive movements. So here I'm reaching for the burr. So the burr is what slides over and you got to see a quick glimpse of that earlier. Pretty simple concept. The rivet gets thicker towards the head of it and the burr is forced down around it. So I grab the number one and I always use a poly mallet. Uh, obviously you're not supposed to strike metal on metal and when you invest in your tools that's not something that uh, you'd be too fond about. So that's the poly mallet you see here. I love that that mallet's got a leather handle. It's pretty cool. Watching it break in is nice and it's got nice brass features. That's from Weaver Leather as well. So with a few strikes here on the brass rivet, it'll be set. Pretty simple. Just slides down. I look on the other side always to make sure that there wasn't any damage done to the leather and that the top is sitting flush. Strike the second one in. Next step in the process is to cut those. So you see there the top is flat and you have the post remaining. So the goal is to cut those down to roughly an eighth inch to be able to add a nice rounded or peened finished look on the backside. Some folks will put the, there's obviously there actually, there's a big debate uh, over which side's the finished side. I personally like the flat side being the finished side, whereas some makers prefer the reverse being the finished side to each their own. All right, so next up is where we're gonna talk about cutters. So that post left over needs to be removed and cutter selection is key. It's the most challenging part about setting rivets is cutting the posts, especially if you're having to cut, you know, more than one, two, 10, 20, 100 at a time. It's very fatiguing on your hands. So having good cutters is pivotal in this situation. So we started, I think, with some Lyman pliers and then from there upgraded to uh, a different type of cutter. Lyman pliers work well, they're just really bulky. Um, they make tool marks on the leather generally. Um, so this was the first type of cutter that we tried. It's a CS Osborne nipper. They work great. Uh, we've had great luck with them. They're not terrible tools. And then when we started using these Nipex cutters, um, you can just clearly feel the difference. They're much more expensive than the CS Osborne's, but they are they're bomb proof. We've actually replaced a couple pairs of those CS Osborne cutters. They warranty them, which is great. Um, but these tools, these Nipex cutters, I have not had any waiver. Uh, they, they're ready to work. They might not cut as great as longer handled tools, but they cut consistently. They cut smooth and they're suitable for any hands. Uh, it's just ergonomically, it feels good. They're just I highly recommend giving them a shot. There's an end cutter and then a side cutter that you see. The side cutter is the one I prefer. Courtney prefers the end cutter. It's got a little bit of a longer handle. So when we're tag teaming glove straps or chin straps and we're knocking a few hundred out at a time, it's really helpful having a second person cutting. So when you're cutting these rivets, be careful. Uh, they fly off. I have been hit in the face, um, had my cheek cut, Courtney's had her cheek cut, fingers cut. Um, I actually started wearing eye protection when I'm cutting these just because it's, especially the brass, they're very volatile when they are snipped. So when that thing's snipped, it generally goes flying and I'm always sporting cuts on my cutting hand from the rivet flying back and hitting me. So don't be surprised when that happens. 
So I'm just cutting them down roughly an eighth inch in height is what's ideal. I like to do a cross cut. So the initial cut and then the second cut. Uh, what that does is when you go to dome it, it makes it round out, seems to be faster and easier versus just doing the one diagonal cut. Give it a shot. You might not like it. It might not be um, something that you feel you need to waste time on that extra step, but I think it adds a very good look to the finished product. So here I'm using the number two, the domer, and you can see where it was struck. The one that struck near the buckle is rounded, whereas the other one is still that sharp end. So I just repeat that process on the other rivet. Um, very simple. Next step up is the number three tool, and that is for doming the front or the finished side. So the brass doesn't dome that great, whereas the copper really domes great. Um, so there you see it's flat. And then as you dome it, ideally that top part is doming downward into the leather. So it kind of gives it a nice textured look. Unfortunately, the brass, you have to really strike it a lot to get it to uh, look great. And sometimes that results in the leather getting beat up around the hardware. So you can see it's kind of got a downward dome to it. And I'll put in a picture um, somewhere of the copper one. So when you dome it, you're essentially also peening what's left on the post on the backside. When you're striking the top, it's forcing the bottom into the anvil or splash anvil, and it's flattening and mushrooming that head out. So a lot of times makers will now turn it over, and I used to as well, and I would now peen the backside. But when you dome the top, it does it for you. Um, so it's helpful with that. Some people don't peen the backside at all after doming it, and that's fine. It's however you prefer the finished product to look. So yeah, tool selection is going to help you with your finished product, with how it looks. Um, anything that you've seen in this video can be done with basic tools from any leather craft store, art store, hardware store, to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, but that's about it for this video. If you have any questions or any requests for further videos, feel free to shoot us a message.